Today's talk is going to be about how do you grade a nonconformity and what's the best method for grading a nonconformity. For those of you that aren't auditors and have no idea what we're talking about here, I'll break it down for you. Number one, whenever you have an audit, you have nonconformities. You have something that doesn't meet a requirement and you have to grade those. Classic old way of doing that was we have minor nonconformities and we have major nonconformities. The minor ones, um, it could just be a single lapse. One little thing is wrong and the auditor said, you got to open up a capo for this. But for those problems that are bigger where we have something that's more significant or um, it's a repeat issue, classically, we would categorize those as major nonconformities. There are some companies out there that also will use a term called critical. So somehow critical is even higher than major nonconformity. But there isn't any standard out there that says, what is the definition of minor? What is the definition of major? What is the de definition of critical? And there isn't necessarily a right or wrong method. Yet, if you don't have all your auditors doing it consistently, you can run into problems. And the auditor that is auditing you from a certification body can say, your auditors are not being consistent in how they grade nonconformities when they do an internal audit. And the key goal here is we're trying to identify what is the priority of this quality issue? Is it a top priority issue? We need to cover this before everything else and fix it right away. Or is this a moderate important issue? We need to address it, but it's not the top priority. Or is this a very low level? We do need to address it, but it's not that important. Um, which is it? How do you grade these? How do you prioritize your resources? And how do we make sure everybody does it consistently? So about a decade ago, um, I'll provide an actual date down below in the description. They came up with a, a proposed system for grading nonconformities that was a numerical system, so a point system. And it was created by the Global Harmonization Task Force, which was a bunch of regulators for different countries like the US, Canada, um, Australia, Japan, uh, Brazil, these different countries got together and they said, okay, this is what we're going to grade these things. And it also included industry participation in these committees. And they came up with this numerical system and that was posted publicly as a free guidance document on how to properly grade nonconformities using this numerical system. And there was, uh, a, the basic system was you would grade things as minor if it was an indirect impact on your quality system and it would get a one point. And then if it, something had a direct impact on your quality of your product, you would grade it as three instead of one. So it'd be a higher number already because it has a direct impact on quality of product. And then they would have three escalation rules. One was if it was a repeat finding. One was if you had something where you were shipping non-conforming product knowingly. So Oh, we, we, I know it's non-conforming, but we really need to ship it out. So ship it anyway, even though it's non-conforming. They won't notice. And then the third possibility was you don't have a, a procedure for something or you don't have a uh, any records for something. And somewhere around, um, I don't know, maybe about five years ago, they came out with an MD-SAP program, a medical device single audit program. It had been in a pilot for a few years, and then they finalized, and they said, this is what we're doing, and it was the similar countries, U.S., Canada, Europe, I'm sorry, not Europe, U.S., Canada, Brazil, Australia, and Japan, and they said, this is the program that we are going to adopt, and we're going to adopt that GHTF grading system, and one of the rules in there about the, uh, you have an absence of a quality system requirement, they put in an and, so it has to be you you have no procedure and you have no records, that would be the escalation rule. So these were the final rules for how to do the MDSAP scoring. And they said, you know, even though theoretically you could have all three escalation rules and direct, and that would be six points, we're gonna cap it at five. You can't have higher score than five. So this was the official system that everybody should be using for MDSAP. It was based on this um, GHTF guidance document. So, um, should we adopt this or should we stick with the old way of doing things? Minor, major, 
and critical or minor and major. How should you do it? There is not a right way and there's not a wrong way. And when you're doing an internal audit, you're not required to adopt one or the other. Either method is right. All that you're required to do is make sure you, that you're consistent, number one. So the best way to make sure it's consistent, have it in your procedure how to do it and train all your auditors to do it that way. And monitor them. Make sure they're grading them that way. Monitor means read the report before you make it approved. If they graded it one way and you don't think that's being consistent, have them change it. So those are your options for these two different systems. Could you come up with another system? Sure. Um, if your notified body or certification body does it a specific way, in general, it's a good idea to do it the same way. The reason why is that way it's consistent between the way the auditor that's auditing you grades things and the way you're grading things. And they can't say you're not doing it correctly because you're doing it the same way they do it. If you're going to come up with your a different method, though, which method should you use? The minor, major, critical, minor, major, or this new point system? Well, for a long time, I was not in favor of the point system. And the reason why is I felt... There are so many auditors that have enough trouble trying to decide whether it's minor or major, which doesn't sound that hard, but they seem to have trouble being consistent. Um, maybe what we should do here is maybe we should um, not think about doing this complicated point system with escalation. But as I really looked at how it was playing out and how auditors were doing it, the grading was very consistent and very quick because they just went by the clause to determine whether it's indirect or direct. It wasn't, does this affect the product or not? It was, what clause is it? And based on the clause, they're determining whether it's a direct impact on product or not, not based on your logic. So it doesn't require a lot of thought. Which clause am I referencing as the requirement? And that determines whether it's indirect or direct impact. So that's a very easy decision. Repeat finding. Show me the previous finding. That shouldn't be that hard. I like to the point where they had and. Um, it has no procedure and no records. That made it very clear. There are a lot of companies that will have procedures, but they won't have records or they'll have very weak records. And those are a little tougher. But making it and, it was very clear, we're going to escalate this or we're not. You have nothing or you have something. You have something, we don't use that escalation rule. And then the last one, if you're shipping product. And for the most part, that one's really solid too. We, you know, it's non-conforming. It failed this test and you shipped it anyway. This is definitely a non-conformity. So I like the system. It seems to be very consistent and very quick grading. So why not go ahead and adopt this new system? And the beauty of training people that way is you don't have to put a lot of thought. You don't argue about it. You Let's not argue about whether we agree with the system or disagree with the system. We're just following a standard. It's an objective standard. Whereas when you come up with different definitions for minor, major, and critical, it depends on the company and there's no standard to go to. So over time, I've warmed up to the MDSAP point system, and that's what I recommend. But the real shift in my opinion and really pushing this uh, MDSAP or numerical grading system occurred recently. I was looking at how we were grading um, non-conformities in a kappa. And I said, hmm, we're putting in a matrix and we're saying high, low, medium. Why do we have a different system for grading the non-conformity that we open up in a kappa, but we, from the system that we have in an audit report, when both of them will probably end up as kappas, why not use the same system? And I thought about this. I said, I can't think of a single reason. So I called one of my employees up and I said, Matthew, what would happen if we did this? Can you see any problem if we just adopted the MDSAP grading program for Kappas as well? And he couldn't think of any. So I switched it and he immediately started getting positive feedback from auditors and clients. So that's the way we're doing it now. We're using the same MDSAP point system for both the nonconformity and the Kappas and for the internal audit findings. All of those use the same point system. Why? because there's a standard out there that tells you how to do it and it's very clearly written and everybody has access to it and it's free. And if you don't understand the system, 
you probably need a little bit of training, but it really shouldn't take that long. They, they designed this for being used globally, multiple languages, multiple regulators agreed on it. It was a public system industry was involved in the development. And a lot of companies now are using the MD SAP uh, process because they're they in, they need it in order to sell their product in Canada, and they ha have to have that NDSAP certificate. So the auditors must use that system. So that's the system that we recommend. Now, could you use a point system for other types of risk-based approaches? And I got thinking about it. I said, you know, whenever we're taking care of any kind of a, a quality system issue in any process, and we want to use a risk-based approach to prioritize our efforts to try to improve that process or grade how the performance of it, of it is. You could use a lot of different systems, but having a one to five scale, which is a very simple um, scale they use for like visually analog scale whenever they're doing clinical studies, like on a scale of one to five, how bad is your pain? Sometimes they'll use one to 10. The problem with those larger scales, one to 10, people argue over whether it's a three or a four or a seven or a six. But when you have a five point scale, the, it's because it's a much coarser grading scale, it's easier to decide because you don't have a lot of numbers to choose from here. So I, I do like that system. So if you're thinking about, we wanna have a risk-based approach and we wanna number things, you could go with a high, low, medium, you could go with major, minor, but this simple five point scale is a really simple system. And if you can come up with rules for your other processes that are as simple and as clear, will this be um, a one or a three? Will this have an escalation or not? Or maybe it's a one and a two and will it have an escalation? That's a really simple system and you could model that across the board. And once people become familiar with it from one source, they'll pr probably be able to adapt pretty quickly for the other procedures as well. Something to think about. I haven't fully developed it out yet, but we're we're looking at changes to make our procedures more clear on how we use a risk-based approach in each of them. We're looking at how we're going to be monitoring and measuring them, making that a little bit more clear in the procedures. So we're trying to make some improvements, and I'd love to know your ideas below in the comments. So thank you very much for your time. Next week, we're doing another live streaming, 1230 Eastern time. So um, if you are available, the topic for next week, it was a request of one of the uh, people that watched this video. They said, could you do a video talking about how clinical studies work in the U.S.? They, they were from another country, and they wanted to know, how do you do a clinical study in the U.S.? What's the process? What's the timeline? What paperwork do you have to fill out? So that's what we're going to talk about next week, and I'll update it on our website. But I hope to see you next week, and thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.